Good morning, church. Welcome to worship, beloved ones. It's wonderful to be together again on this third Sunday in the season of Lent as we continue to worship together from a distance, but joined again by the love of our God that is manifested through our hearts for ourselves and for one another. And so this Sunday, on this third Sunday in the season of Lent, we continue to examine the world around us through the lens of the cross. Last Sunday, we were looking more at ourselves. This Sunday, we'll look at the world around us, the economic world. What would Jesus be saying about our economic context and situation? Would there be any tables that would be turned over? Would Jesus be chasing anything out of the temple places where we gather? It is our time to look deep with inside our hearts and to also ask ourselves, what are we zealous for? How do we manifest our zealousness for God's work in the community and in the world? Welcome again to worship. And for those who may be tuning in with us this morning for worship, who have not uh, had an occasion to be in worship, and for my ability to meet you, my name is Gary Richards, and I'm the pastor here at the Belmont Watertown United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. What are some things that you can do during Lent? You can meditate if you to calm down if you're annoyed. It really helps for me. Thank you, Liam. All right, Cora. Why do we have seven candles? Because the seven candles represent the seven Sundays until Easter. And why are there three candles off? Because this one's going to be for this week and two weeks already passed of Lent. Oh, Palm Sunday! Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. Because we went to church once without the coronavirus. Oh, and we looked in our Easter eggs, and one had the little oh, dog in it. Nice. Like helping my friends, I can make sure they're okay if someone, if someone uh, hurts them. Do you like to help people? Do you miss people? Who do you miss? All the people. Do you help animals at school? Uh, I do the chickens. Do your teachers help you? Yeah. Oh, Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that one receives, it is in self-forgetting that one finds, it is in pardoning that one is pardoned, it is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Thank you to the Waller family, that was really beautiful. Good morning everyone, um, please join me in the call to worship. All creation proclaims the glory of God. Heaven and earth sing of the Lord's handiwork. Blessed are we who share God's goodness. Gracious is God, the source of what sustains us. From birth to death, we are God's beloved. Open your hearts to the will of the Lord. Blessed are we to whom God speaks. May the word of the Lord revive our souls. From God's servant people, much is expected. The decrees of the Lord are sure, and the precepts of God are aright. Let us walk in the way of the Lord. Listen, O God, 
to the meditations of our hearts. May what we think and say be acceptable to you. prayer. Loving God, rock and redeemer, hear us, we pray. Thank you for the precious gift of life and the blessings that sustain us. Be patient with your people as we take time to consider, oops, okay, to, sorry, the computer did something weird there. Be patient with your people as we take time to center our minds for worship. Lord, Refresh our innermost being with a renewed commitment to know and serve you. Tend to our tired souls with your comforting spirit and strengthen us to fearlessly resist evil and seek justice. All this we pray in your holy name. Amen. Today's scripture is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currencies sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, Get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, 
destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Connie, for leading us in worship this morning. And uh, thank you also, Elin and Kirk, for the beautiful music that uh, welcomed us into worship. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you again for this occasion to gather our hearts together and to be in your presence. Fill our sacred space at home as we turn our face towards you. Welcome us into your holy place and let your spirit fill our homes with joy and with a time that is duly appropriate for this season. Help us to look within, to examine the world as well with the eyes of our hearts and help us to continue to walk along the path that Jesus has set before us. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of our lips and the actions of our hands be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. You may have heard this past Friday's news when the economic reporters in Wall Street were celebrating the increase in jobs during the course of the past month. It was reported that over 379,000 jobs were added to the employment rolls. This is quite an increase, not exactly where we want to be. It's not pre-pandemic times, but it is a, a good sign. And while again, we're still far from pre-pandemic times, the employment rate is trending down and the employment rate is trending up. And with the slow reopening of certain sectors of both the private and public economy, we're starting to see a little bit of improvement. And while some economic forecasters are seeing some hope on the future, not everyone is seeing that same view. We must take note and we must pay close attention to our neighbors' situations in the context in which the economic life of Black and Hispanic and people of color is not improving at the same rate that we see others receiving the benefits of the uplift. Matter of fact, uh, Black and Hispanic workers are still somewhere between 17 and 20% unemployed. That's for both men and women more unemployed women than men in those two communities of color. And so we must pay attention as people of God that the whole community is not rising up at the same rate. And so we turn to scripture, we turn to our faith lives to again examine what is happening around us, not only within us, but around us. And again, especially in this season of Lent, we hold up the cross as the lens from which we look through. The increase in employment rates coupled with the U.S. Senate's passage of the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill and the ongoing unfolding of the vaccination plan continues to also influence the global stock market. Even though the stock market has been on a roller coaster, it has posted very significant economic growth, and it still looks to the future as a hopeful sign is awaiting for more economic growth. During the holy season of Lent, we're not called to intentionally pay attention to the economic conditions that are around us. But this morning, Jesus does in his particular context. 
the holy season of Lent that we are called to examine not only, as I said before, our inner selves, our spiritual life, our disciplines. We're also called to examine the external environment. We're called to examine the world that we occupy and the systems from which we benefit from. In other words, we need to ask ourselves those questions. Lent is a season full of questions, questions that help us learn more about ourselves and the world, again, examining both through the lens of the cross. And so in the season of Lent, we are called to ask, how are we benefiting from this economic upturn that we're, we're starting to see a little bit of during this season? How do we see the benefits affecting the poor? Is there any improvement in their life? How is the church benefiting from the stock market roller coaster? Does it or is it not an issue? And of course, the theological question that we should always be asking is where is God in the midst of this economic life that we share? And lastly, the question that I invite you to think about is, how do we as Christ's disciples, those that are called into the courtyard of economic life, how do we behave? How do we examine what is happening around us? And what are we called to do? In Jesus's time of the center of political and economic activity, was the temple. The temple was a huge project. You heard in the gospel text that it was under construction for 46 years. If you wanna think about it in terms of a local application, think about it as a religious big dig, although it even went longer than our own big dig. And during the construction, it was the period, it was the largest employer, thousands upon thousands of people, mainly men, were working on the actual construction. And of course, there were countless supporting trades, craftspeople, and services that supported the construction. The temple construction fueled the economy. And the temple, once completed, was the center of all economic life, religious life, and political life. The temple thrived off of not only the temple tax that all were required to pay, but the temple was also the largest financial institution. It held large sums of money. Those with great wealth would deposit their wealth in the temple. The temple acted as the, the largest institution that maybe we would consider what makes up Wall Street. The temple also had its associated businesses and it also had the marketplace. The temple would establish a large marketplace, particularly around the high holidays. Three times a year, pilgrims would, would come to Jerusalem to worship, to be in community and to sacrifice. Sacrifice gifts to God where they would share in the bounty as well as to leave a significant portion for the religious leadership. At Passover, which is the context for this morning's reading from St. John, pilgrims of every economic and social location would be coming into Jerusalem and each one was required to make an offering. And at Passover, Passover, this particular time that we're looking at through the eyes of John, thousands upon thousands of pilgrims would be arriving in Jerusalem. New Testament scholar, Joachim Jeremias, who wrote years ago, estimated that at the time of Passover, 180,000 pilgrims, including the residents of Jerusalem, would be gathered for worship in and around the temple space. 
Now, some of those folks came from distant lands, so they couldn't bring animals with them or it was just too cumbersome. And they brought money. They brought the, the coins that they had collected or had earned. They brought that Roman currency that needed to be exchanged because the temple was not going to accept any coins with the image of the emperor. The temple had its own currency. And so money changes were set up alongside of those who were selling various types of sacrificial animals, the cows, the sheep, the, the geese, the grains, the oils. Everything that was there in the marketplace was there to serve the religious and economic well-being of the temple community. And so hundreds of thousands of pilgrims throughout the year would come to Jerusalem to worship and to sacrifice their gifts. Pilgrims were also, when they got to the temple, were required, as I mentioned before, to pay a temple tax. And again, not only would they exchange coins for the purchasing of those sacrificial animals, but they also had to go and pay the appropriate tax. So you get the picture of what was happening in that courtyard that surrounded the holier space of the temple. The actual space was called the courtyard of the Gentiles. It was a place where Gentiles could also come and celebrate and worship during the high holidays or any time. But again, it was also the place that was set up to do the sell, sales of the, the sacrificial animals. Jesus and his disciples were part of the pilgrimage. Jesus and his disciples were part of that pilgrimage that didn't have a lot of resources. They were the members of the, the sector of, of, the, of the nation that came from the rural areas of which provided a very significant portion of the wealth to the temple economy. So when Jesus arrives with his disciples, he's standing in the midst of crowds, people shoulder to shoulder, pushing to find their way into that courtyard of the Gentiles. He was there with all the pilgrims flooding the streets of Jerusalem. And it was a joyous occasion. There was feasting and socializing and worship. There was a time when people would see one another, family members from distant communities, one of the three times of the year that they gathered. As a matter of fact, when pilgrims gathered in Jerusalem, it was a time when the social barriers and the differences kind of faded away. No matter what you had in terms of wealth or property, when you arrived in Jerusalem during the time of the pilgrimage, you were wearing the same garb that everybody else was. There was a commonality. There was a community spirit. It was a time that everyone cherished. And while the congregation enjoyed being one in worship, the reality was that there was this economic and class division within the pilgrim community. And it was displayed most clearly by the way and ability of those who made their sacrifices, who did the purchasing of the animals and the grains and the oils that were offered up to, the, to God and to the, to the religious leadership. Jesus himself was not always happy with the, the worship practices of what was going on in the temple. More than once, he would critique the religious leaders about how they were conducting worship and how they were living out their lives as religious leaders. He found himself looking more closely at what was happening in the midst of the religious leaders, seeing them lean towards more oh, increasing wealth of the religious elite what is the worshiping matter? God. That they were putting more interest in their treasures on earth, not the treasures in heaven. Jesus understood that the the gift of sacrificial animals was, was not wrong, that it was part of the, the worship cult, the worship 
community, the worship tradition and practices. But what Jesus had a problem with was the unfair weight that was put on the poor as they too wanted to be faithful pilgrims. Jesus, I imagine, was standing off to the side watching the poor having come together as a family and scraped together a few coins to purchase whatever animal they could afford. They might not have been able to purchase that sacrificial lamb. Maybe they contributed to purchasing one among 10 or 12 different families. But Jesus knew that they had taken from their own food budget. They had taken from their basic needs to, to meet the requirements of the temple sacrifice and tax. This is what angered Jesus. He knew that people were suffering in a way that did not please God, that they were taking from themselves more than they should be, that they were becoming victims of, a, of an economic system that was not meant or constructed to behave in that way. And so Jesus found that the courtyard commercial practices were, were well beyond their intended purposes. And we can only imagine from the text that was shared with us this morning that what Jesus saw and what he heard disgraced the sacred space, God's house. Jesus was also concerned, we can imagine, with the Gentiles that were given this particular space, that the marketplace may have taken up their worship space, that maybe they could not be in a time of prayer or worship because there was so much commercial activity around them. So Jesus acted upon what he saw. Jesus enters into that space and he disrupts it. He turns the tables of the money changers. He fashions a whip out of whatever he had there, cloth, and he chases the animals out of the courtyard. He could not tolerate what he saw. And he proclaims to those that were there that they had turned his father's house into a marketplace. Other readings from the Gospel of Mark, or Matthew, or Luke, Jesus even calls those vendors a band of thieves. He knew exactly what was happening, especially to those that were poor. Disrupting the courtyard marketplace was a temporary act. I'm sure Jesus was just in one place. He didn't disrupt the whole marketplace. But the authorities rushed to where the action was and where the disruption was, and they, they asked Jesus about his authority. What, what sign? What, what, if you are here as a, as a rabbi, where is God in the midst of all this? Show us a sign. Jesus' response when asked about his authority to disrupt the marketplace turns not on material destruction of the temple. Even though Jesus says, tear down this temple in three days, I will reconstruct it. Jesus, as we know, is not talking about tearing down the temple, but he was talking about the future of his own life. The fact that he would be arrested that he would be tortured, that he would be put to death on the cross, and that he would rise again in three days. Jesus was talking about something very radical. In that point in time, Jesus says, it's not about this temple that took 46 years to construct. It's about God's new temple. That God is residing within me, says Jesus. And I reside within God. Now this was going to get Jesus the attention of the religious leaders. From this point on in the Gospel of John, Jesus is a marked man. He has come into the religious setting. 
He has claimed and disrupted that very same setting. He has claimed and proclaimed his place and his relationship to God. Shortly after the religious authorities questioned Jesus, they turned the tables back right up. They brought the animals back in. But what stuck with them was what Jesus said about himself. Jesus' response when asked about the authority to disrupt the marketplace, again, did not have a focus on the material, but on the relational aspects between him and God, and God and God's people. And while we hear no immediate opposition from the religious authorities, surely, surely this was the beginning of the end for Jesus. What about Jesus' disciples? They're standing around watching all this happen. And before Jesus proclaims his future, the disciples step back and they offer their own response. They step back and, and, and they draw their attention to the words of the psalmist. They see in Jesus and they remember the psalmist saying, zeal for your house will consume me. In this morning's translation, we heard passion. Passion for your house will consume me. That's what the discipleship community was thinking when they're, when they're watching Jesus, when they're listening and watching what he was doing. Jesus had great zeal for the worship community and the life of the temple. The faithful Jew, you a pilgrim. And no matter how restricted were his resources, I'm sure he also made his offerings. But Jesus rejected the free-for-all commercial activity in the courtyard. He saw that there was a shift away from worshiping and praising God for God, the creator, sustainer. And he saw the industry and the commercialization of the temple displacing its true purpose. Jesus came to worship God with all the other pilgrims. He came to worship and remember in this particular time of the Passover, God's great act of liberation. It was the time where the pilgrims would come and they would remember what God did in freeing their ancestors from Egypt, breaking the bonds of slavery and returning them home. That's why Jesus came to Jerusalem. And that's why the thousands came with him. Jesus was abiding in God and God was abiding in him. And that was the radical shift that Jesus proclaimed after turning the tables. The disciples and the religious leaders witnessed Jesus' zeal for a right relationship with God and God's people. The economic practices of the temple courtyard overshadowed the, the true purpose of the temple. And Jesus' zealous action made it known that this was not God's way. But there was a new way before them. God's living presence in him, Jesus. Lent is the season we examine within ourselves and outside. We take a close look at our own spiritual life and practices what we offer up to God and how we give thanks to God for what we receive from God's generosity and bounty. We may discover during Lent that quiet and sacred places that, that feed our souls during the season of Lent. And when we're in meditation and prayerful thought, we may even uncover the depths of our own zeal for God's will and way in the world. Lent is a time for taking holy notice of what makes us turn tables upside down in the world. When we examine whether it's the economic life of our nation or the social life of our nation or the political aspects of our world, we, we sometimes find ourselves just wanting to, to turn the tables upside down. 
because we feel that in the depths of our hearts that this is not right. This is not the way that God intended the world to be. Whether we're looking at the situation in Myanmar or the fact that there are still many in Texas suffering from the storm that passed through them, still having to boil their water, or we're looking at the, the unjust systems that deny brothers and sisters of color access to vaccines and the resources to revitalize their lives. We want to turn tables around and, and Lent is the time for us to take holy notice of what that is that we have zealous faith for. And Lent is also our season of accepting the invitation that Christ offers his disciples to put ourselves in right relationship with God and, and to seek the same in the world we live in make our own contributions. Friends in Christ, as a congregation, as, a, as the body of Christ, as a place in community where Christ abides in us and we in him. It behooves us to take time during the season of Lent to, to continue to examine our own temple space in life. And that's what we're doing as a congregation. We are in the midst of examining our temple space and life. We are challenged today and have been for decades by the, the cultural shifts away from the mainline religious life. But still there's this longing for community and connection. We're challenged by the, the fading of the, the way church used to be, but still the desire of so many for a place to come and worship and be in community. There are pilgrims that are part of this community, as we all are, but there are also others that are seeking a way into community. So as a community that is examining its temple space in life, we, we must look at what needs to change. We also must ask this question as a community. What are we zealous about when it comes to being the body of Christ, the church in Watertown and Belmont? What are we zealous about? What are we passionate about? that drives us to the place where we're willing to maybe even turn over a few tables to make change that we never anticipated making before and to ask the questions, what does need to be turned upside down and where do we need to step forward as the resurrected community of Jesus Christ? When we look through the lens of the cross, we see ourselves in a, particular economic situation that affords us an opportunity to put our zeal into action. We ought to be zealous about contributing to a new ministry and, and a new mission as we examine our space, our temple space. We ought to be zealous about transforming economic and social opportunities for our neighbors. How can we use this temple space, these temple resources, the temple treasury for advancing the passion of Jesus Christ? We ought to be zealous about right-sizing our temple space to ensure its presence and purpose for years to come because we know there are pilgrims. We saw some beautiful young pilgrims from the Waller family doing their Lenten devotion. We are obligated. We ought to be zealous about making sure there's a place for the youngest in our midst to fall in love with Jesus Christ and to serve God. Well, friends, Jesus would surely find reasons to turn tables outside the walls of our temple place. And I know that he is in his own way, through the Holy Spirit, turning hearts in the direction of making change. 
I can imagine that Jesus would even come into this holy temple place and find a few tables to turn upside down as well. My prayer for us, not only during this Lenten season, but as we move forward as a pilgrim congregation, where Christ abides within us and we abide in Christ, that we discover our zeal for Christ, our zeal for this place, this this holy place that we've been so blessed to, to share, but also zeal for the opportunity that we have within and outside of these walls to bring joy and love and justice and peace into the lives of not only ourselves and the community, but to God's beloved outside these walls those who find themselves among the communities of the disinherited, for those that are seeking recovery, for those that are hungry, not just for the material foodstuff that we can provide through a food pantry, but come looking for the nutrition and the spiritual goodness of the bread of life and the living water. May we discover and rediscover our zeal for the, the ministry of Jesus Christ in this place and beyond. Amen. Let us pray. O Holy One, gracious and loving God that fills this space and all space, we turn our hearts and minds towards you. You know our prayers and our hearts. Before we utter one word, you know well what troubles us, what we're thankful for, what we remember and what we have forgotten. Holy One, we ask that you strengthen us, you draw us close and Give us the words for prayer, spoken and unspoken. Keep on our minds and in our hearts those that we have named before you. For those that are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. For the precious gift of life that we celebrate in birthdays. For the opportunity to serve for nations far from here that are struggling for peace and justice. For those throughout the world who wait for a vaccine, but see it off in the distant future. May the economic life of this holy and sacred Lo, may the power and wealth of all nations, and especially the most wealthy, do everything possible, O Lord, with your help to distribute medical justice, that all can receive the gift that may save their life. We pray, O Lord, and give thanks for this church. And God, we thank and praise you for the incredible opportunity and challenge that we have. We create your temple space. Help us, oh God, and feed the fire of our zealousness for your holy space. Help us, oh God, to lean into the decisions that we must make so that your purposes and will through Jesus will continue in this time and to thy will be done. We pray, O oh God, for all those around us that continue to, to work on the front lines. Let us not allow the word essential to become so trite, but let us remember what it truly means. It is life-giving and life-saving. And so we pray for those in the private and public sector that 
sustain us from day to day. For educators, public safety workers, healthcare workers, those that tend to us at the gas stations and at the marketplace. Help us, oh God, to be the pilgrims that you call us to be and to stay on the path that Jesus has set before us. And to be bold with every step and to be fearless with every gospel action. All this and much more we pray in your holy name. Amen. Before we turn to Holy Communion, I want to raise up an offering plate that I have here with my tithe that I'm placing into the plate. I do that as my personal tithe, but also it is representative of all the gifts and tithes that have been made up to this point. It represents also those that are sitting in the office in the offering box there. I offer my gift with gratitude and thanks for what God has given to me and my family. Sustain us during this difficult time. I offer this gift as again, a, a symbol as all those gifts that have come to this church to help us sustain our life together. As visible signs of gratitude for sharing in God's bounty. We commit ourselves to returning a portion of God's gifts. Nothing I have done brings this. It is all God. God's work with me, through me, and for me allows me to, to make this offering. And so I give thanks for yours and for my ability to offer. Let us commit ourselves and our gifts to God. Let us pray together this prayer. Loving and generous God, since the very beginning you have provided for your people, only because of you can we realize your will here on earth. Lord, we humbly return to you a small part of what you have shared with us. We pray that your wisdom and righteousness will flow from these gifts in our lives. Holy One, make our simple efforts to be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. I invite you to prepare with me for the celebration of Holy Communion. I hope that you have your small cup of uh, juice and the wafer attached to it. Uh, please open up that first piece of cellophane on top of the cup that will expose the wafer so you'll be ready and uh, have them set aside. Again, those are elements that you received in your Lenten bag that were consecrated at an earlier prayer service. Lord, we humbly offer our praise and thanks. We come to your table with grateful hearts and hungry souls. Nourish us, O oh God, with your life-giving goodness and revive our souls and clear our faults. You, O oh God, offer mercy and hope to this broken world. And together we say, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord. Out of the depths of God's love for all people, Jesus joined his heart with the meek and oppressed. He turned the tables of those who robbed the poor Blessed are we who are called to follow in his path. We are here to do what is acceptable to God. Glory to God, our creator and sustainer. The word of Jesus is ours to follow. The sacrifice of Jesus is ours to share. Blessed are we who gather together even though we are separated. We thank you, loving Redeemer. Let us remember how Jesus made God's love visible. He broke bread. He lifted a loaf of bread and while thanking God, he, he broke open the bread to share it with his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. And Jesus with gratitude to God. Before his disciples, he lifted a cup of wine and then he passed it to his disciples 
And he shared the good news of God's promise of forgiving love, saying, drink from this, all of you. We gather at the Lord's table to remember God's acts of love. We bow to the name above all names, confessing with one voice, Christ is the Lord, and proclaiming to heaven and earth, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, send your spirit to bless our sharing of your gifts at this table and at the table of all those who have gathered. And may these gifts of your creation, this simple juice and wafer and bread and, and water, may these gifts of your creation unite us with Jesus so that we abide in him and he abides in us. Fill us, O God, with your love and mercy and strengthen us for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to take the wafer from your cup and to take and eat. Know that this body is broken for you, the body of Christ, God's gift of love given for you. And I invite you to peel back the foil from your cup if you haven't already done so. And to take the cup and to know that this is God's love poured out for you. The blood of Christ, God's gift of love given for you. Take and eat and drink. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to, to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to reach out to those that are within your sacred space right there and to exchange a sign of Christ's peace. And if you're by yourself, I'm waving to Joel. If you're by yourself, look into your gallery view of all those that have gathered in worship with you. Wave to them. Give them a sign of peace, a blessing. Pour out the love of Christ from your heart to theirs. Peace of Christ be with all of you. Would I want to be a Christian? Lord, I want to be like Jesus.
Let us turn to our announcements, our way of sharing our life together as the church. Sunday school announcement, uh, Mary's House Easter Baskets, a uh, ministry of compassion and mercy and love from the Sunday school to our neighbors. So there'll be a collection of items for those baskets. And uh, here comes a promo. If I were to get something for an 11-year-old boy, it would be a non-hollow chocolate Easter bunny with jelly in the middle, maybe. If I were to have, if I were to give someone a um, seven-year-old boy something, I would give them some Legos because I have a lot of friends that like Legos and art. If I were to give a 10-year-old girl a gift for Easter, I'd probably get her maybe a stuffed animal because. I really like those, so I think it would be best for someone else. If I were to get a nine-year-old girl or something, I would get her um, lots and lots of candy. <laughs> if I were to get um, um, an eight-year-old boy um, something in their um, Easter basket, I would get a whole bunch of chocolate coins. If I were to get a present for a 10-year-old boy, I would get them a Nintendo Switch or some chocolate. I don't even know what a Nintendo Switch is. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sunday School leaders, uh, for that uh, promotion of the Easter baskets uh, for Mary's house. And I was just saying that Joel, someone will have to tell me what a Nintendo Switch is. Worship on a Wednesday evening, 7 to 7.30. And we continue to collect food for both food pantries. Uh, the Belmont Gym is the site, 10 a.m. to noon. And the next donation day is the 3rd of April and we're collecting soup and macaroni and cheese. And thank you very much to Luis and all those who gathered and provided the donations uh, for yesterday's collection. May we go forth from this place of holy gathering, even though it is virtual, may we go forth from our own sacred and holy places, the places that we claim as our own and where we encounter God's love day in and day out. May we go forth into the world, no matter where we go outside our doors or not, May we go forth with a spirit in the joy of being those that are zealous for what God is doing and how we can get in on what God is doing. Go forth as disciples on your Lenten journey. Hold high the cross and put it before you as you look through and look within so that we all find ourselves journeying together in this Lenten time as pilgrims of love and compassion and mercy, willing to go all the way with Jesus. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.